Welcome, welcome. We'll uh, start with introductions in a little bit. Um, I'm glad you're all here for our first map time. Should be an exciting chat with uh, with my colleague. But first, so we're co-hosting this. Uh, so I'm Dave Weimer from the Harvard Map Collection. I'm co-hosting with Garrett Nelson, who you now see, and he can say hello. Hi, Dave. Hi, everyone. Hi. Hello. Um, so we are glad you're all here for our first uh, weekly of our weekly uh, map time chats. Today, we'll be talking with Ian Fowler, who's curator and geospatial librarian at the Lionel Pincus and Princess Furial Map Division at the New York Public Library. Hi. Um, we'll be here every week at around this time. Uh, if it ever changes, we'll let you know. And uh, either Gary and I will be hosting and we'll uh, just be talking cool maps. Should Gary be a great Andrew. conversation. Dave, I was curious, yeah. New York, that's, that's somewhere between uh, like New Haven and Philadelphia, right? I think so. Okay. Uh, I have to look at a map to be sure, but yeah. Yes. I, I, I know some of our viewers might not be familiar with New York City. Um, this yeah. being a very Boston-based crowd, but yeah, just a, little, <laughs> just a little bit south. Like if you go to New Haven and you keep going, uh, it's down there. Yeah. All right. Well, I'll, um, let, I'll let you check right. with uh, Ian, and we'll be tuned in again. Hello to all our Leventhal Map Center followers out there. Uh, it should be a great conversation. Have yeah. Fun. Great. Good to see you, Garrett. All right. All right. Good to see you, Dave. All right, Ian, we're ready for you. I think I can just add you here if I can find you. You sure yet, Ian? Well, we're waiting for Ian. Um, while we wait for him, we will... Yeah, where is he? Well, there we go. There's Ian. All right. Well, we can't yet. Why can't Ian join yet? We're still working out the technical kinks of this uh, this system. Um, it says Ian cannot join. I don't know why Ian can't join. Uh, today, once we get Ian, I can see you're here, Ian. Um, but it says you can't join. Um, so we'll figure out, we'll try to figure out these, uh, these kinks. Ian's going to be talking about, uh, some maps from the Raymond Fink map collection. Um, they're pretty cool. They have a lot, they're of places in Laos and they are all drawn by hand. They were made, uh, he'll talk more about this, but they were made, um, as part of some social science research. I still don't know why Ian can't join. Um, if anyone has any hints about why Ian can't join, you can let me know. Um, Uh, Ian has to send a request. So Ian, press those little two little faces that are uh, kind of like conjoined twins. And then, uh, oh, he follows us. He better follow us. Um, and then send me a request to, um, to chat. Um, You're all very helpful, and I appreciate it. We're, uh, uh, although not quite digital native, so we don't quite, it's not quite intuitive. Um, if you're lucky, you'll see our cat. All right, if you're just joining us, this is our uh, first of our map time uh, 
lunchtime conversations. Um, we'll be talking with Ian Fowler from New York Public Library as soon as we're able to get it to work. Um, you don't have two little faces. Um, maybe try leaving and coming back. Um, the next week, um, hopefully with fewer technical difficulties, we'll be uh, featuring Catherine Parker, who's a research officer at Barry Lawrence Rudiman Antique Maps and an associate editor for the Hackwood Society. Uh, she'll be talking about George Anson and some maps and books. Uh, and it'll be really great. She's uh, super smart and uh, a hero to us all. And in the following weeks, we'll have uh, many conversations with different people, both map makers and uh, map enthusiasts. The, uh, there is a schedule up on the Harvard Library website. Um, so if you just Google map time, uh, Harvard Library, you should be able to get to that page and see the whole schedule. Um, if you're interested in talking with us about maps you make or maps you study, uh, send us a, a message on Instagram and we'll, uh, uh, we'll, we'll follow up. Um, the, we're still waiting to see if this will work. Oh yeah, here we go. Waiting for New York Public Library maps. Connecting. It's Ian. Good afternoon, David. We're up. All right. We're up. I had to use my phone. My computer is too old. Oh, no. I am truly not a digital native. Yeah. All right. Um, so can you just uh, introduce yourself for the, the fans? Why, but of course, I am Ian Fowler. I am the curator and geospatial librarian at the New York Public Library's Lionel Pincus and Princess Furial Map Division, coming to you live from our secret remote location. Yeah, um, great. So Ian's going to be talking to us about um, a few maps from the Raymond Fink collection. Um, so Ian, why don't you just tell me which one you'd like to start with, and I'll pull it up on the screen, and you can, uh, you can tell us about it. Uh, sure, just pull one up. Um, so right. just a little background, the uh, Raymond Fink collection uh, came to us last year from the man himself, Raymond Fink. Uh, and this is a collection of maps that were employed in a cross-section survey of Laos in 1959, six years after independence from France. This was part of a government questionnaire service. Uh, and the study questions asked about major, major issues uh, affecting the residents of Laos, including uh, how they got their news and information, their level of trust of the government. Um, so one of the things that will probably be familiar for any 20th century scholars of uh, former French Indo-Chinese mapping is that all of the available military mapping was pretty much useless once you got outside of Vietnam. So what Raymond Fink and his crew had to do was they had to train the native Laotians in map making, uh, both for the provincial capitals and for the randomly selected towns that they used in the survey. Um, so this here is an example of one of the maps that was made by one of the surveying participants. Uh, and this is of a village uh, on uh, one of the rivers. Um, and so you can see it, they were instructed to include houses of worship, uh, major schools, academies, um, since this is still on the French model, uh, and then updated roadways and geographic features. You can see it's very sparse, but this is a great uh, example of a sort of community mapping that was done at this time. Uh, and then if you go to the sketchier one, Dave, Uh, so this, if Dave can get out of the way. Yeah, I don't know if I can get out of the way. We had this problem before. Well, we'll just oh. assume you can't. That's right. good. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that happened uh, when they got into the villages was they found that the maps that they had were even more uh, worthless. And so these maps were actually made by members of these Laotian villages. So these, this is true personal mapping, uh, and you can see uh, up in the left there above Dave, uh, they 
pointed out some key points of interest. Uh, and so even in 1959, these are really some of the only maps that were accessible to the, to the west of these uh, Laotian provincial capitals and Laotian villages. Yeah, one of the interesting things I, you know, I, I was looking at the, uh, in preparing for this, I was looking at some of the articles that Raymond Fink had written uh, about uh, the research they, they had done. And, um, you know, he talks about there not being any maps and then having to write out instructions for um, how to find, like how to do the surveys um, based on maps that didn't yet exist. Uh, yeah, it's really, it's really fascinating. And that's one of the great things uh, we did uh, the New York Public Library did attain it as a true archive. So we do have um, the surveying questionnaires. We have the methods that you're talking about for how to make, uh, how to prepare to make these maps of places that had not yet been mapped yet, and how to ask surveys, uh, survey questions about places that had not yet been mapped by the West. Um, and this is an example of, a, I believe, a Osloid print that was taken from the French um, that they, those little blue circles are the uh, houses that they surveyed. Um, and there are, yeah, so there's uh, some names of the families that they were going to survey. Uh, and this is a, an interesting example of uh, doing manuscript annotations. They also updated these maps sometimes. So even geographic features such as the rivers could be in the wrong location or orientation. Uh, the roads, once you got outside of Vietien, were completely unreliably mapped. And so really speaks to uh, the level of the lack of cartographic knowledge that uh, even the French had uh, in uh, Southeast Asia at this time. Yeah, and it's really interesting that, that you know, the to think about where some of these materials come and they live. And, you know, I think most uh, researchers or people uh, don't expect necessarily to find a whole archive of um, the history of surveying uh, people rather than surveying land in a map collection. Uh, how do you how do you uh, get the word out about these kind of archival uh, materials that aren't necessarily uh, purely map based? That's a great question, David, and I really appreciate you asking it. Uh, so we collaborate with uh, our archives division at the library. Um, before this very unfortunate pandemic happened, uh, we actually had a uh, lecture with Raymond in our new Center for Research in the Humanities scheduled for next month uh, that hopefully we'll be able to do in the fall. Uh, and so that brings us multiple channels, both through the Archives Division and the MAP Division, uh, with our researchers to bring that uh, kind of focus together and expand the groups of people that could potentially find this information useful. Um, obviously, map people with our interest uh, both in uh, personal mapping and counter mapping, and then also with people who are interested in especially government, U.S. government interactions in Southeast Asia in the lead up to the Vietnam War, um, and then also people who are interested in historic surveying of peoples um, and how those processes went on. Um, it's also interesting because it was kind of a quasi-federal um, kind of private professional association venture. Uh, and so a lot of the talks that we've gotten transcripts from, from Raymond, uh, are more for the professional association side of things. So it does mm -hmm. cross a lot of research boundaries, but I think it's very beneficial for everyone. Yeah, that sounds great. And you know, one of the things I was thinking about when I, looking, when, it, when, when I was looking at them was how they help us understand the relationship between maps and demographic data more broadly, uh, because, you know, in, as you're saying, in the making of them, there's this back and forth between um, not having a map, having to make a map, and then recording information about the surveys on the map. Um, you know, I think often we think about maps as a way of representing demographic data, but it sounds like one of the things that comes out of this collection is actually that um, maps are crucial for creating demographic data as well. Yeah, and that's very true. And once um, the archives are, are cataloged and we have proper metadata and opened up, um, which hopefully will be soon after we're reopened, it's really fascinating to go in and see the notes that both the Americans and their Laotian counterparts have about going into these villages at this time when Southeast Asia is having an uprising against uh, the remnants of French colonial rule. Mm -hmm. And so there are notes in there, especially going to these remote villages, um, about uh, sympathies towards the French and sympathies towards Vietnam and Cambodia. 
Uh, and that is really interesting, too, to think about that coming in at a time uh, when, and, you know, this was prepared under Eisenhower. So this is really before the U.S. in any large way is thinking about any military inter interference in the region. Uh, and so having this data that later does get perverted um, by the Kennedy administration as kind of a neutral survey into what's going on in Laos that's then perverted into something else under McNamara later. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that, that, you know, gets at a lot of the, the kind of power and danger of any of these archival, uh, archival creations is that they have, they, they live on well after uh, their initial creation. Um, the, and I think one of the, one of the things you, you mentioned there is the, uh, I think if I was reading some of the stuff right, it, um, they, you know, they're training uh, Laotians to to do a lot of the surveys. So, you know, Fink isn't himself going to every one of these villages. And in fact, I think a lot of the, they didn't want Western uh, researchers going to many of the villages. And I think that might link up to what you're saying about the kind of suspicion of kind of French colonial rule. Yeah, and that's, you know, that's interesting, both from the map perspective and the statistical analysis perspective is, you know, trying to reduce the level of error once you've gotten to the provincial capitals and especially in the villages is having, um, you know, Laotians go in and make the maps and do the surveys themselves. Uh, and, you know, I think that's interesting for a number of reasons, especially because, you know, like any country, Laos has regional divisions and other things. And so um, also dealing with the fact that, you know, it's, you know, you can't really take somebody from Northeast Laos and put them in Southwest Laos and expect it just to work. And then dealing with those types of uh, specifics. Um, and it really shows, I think, in the maps, especially the small hand-drawn ones of the villages. Yeah. Um, so how do these, how do you think of these uh, maps as fitting into the larger uh, collection at the at the maps division at the NYPL. Uh, it, it fits in, in in some really interesting ways. You know, we've um, curatorially we've really been trying to push for these unique archives um, and try to find these collections that cut across research profiles. So kind of bringing all of us out of our own silos and boxes. And I think this is a great example of something that does that and is useful for a variety of researchers. Um, so we're going to have some blog posts uh, about this collection coming up once we're back in business, um, some lectures, uh, and really pushing the research aspect of it. Um, and what's great about the new Center for Research on the Humanities is it brings all these different researchers together coming from their own point of view to look at these collections in an open house format, which can then inform them. And we can also, as curators, get enhanced ideas from our researchers about what we should be collecting and how we can better use these collections. Yeah, that's a great point. That's kind of back and forth in, in how collection development works and how it, it grows. Um, do you feel like that's um, some, a change in the how the map collection there has been, the map division has been collecting things, or is that you're growing on uh, previous work? Uh, definitely some previous work was laid down both by Alice Hudson and Matt Knudsen um, and doing this cross-divisional kind of collecting. Um, I've done some other things as well. Uh, you know, we got a, a very unique... Um, kind of register of all the Vanderbilt lands uh, that had a lot of maps, but was also done in manuscript. So that uh, is in the archives division. Uh, and so we really are, I feel, as a library, trying to kind of break down these divisional and research barriers and really look at what is most useful for enhancing the collections we already have, and then looking forward to what we can collect together that really brings in a holistic view of research. Yeah, no, oh, that's great. Um... Yeah, because I know that yeah, you and I both have both try and uh, whenever we can talk about how maps are not just uh, not just maps, but part of a bigger ecosystem of of knowledge and and kind of social relationships. Um, so how do you, you know? You've mentioned this a few times. Going back, once we get back to our our offices, um, what kind of work have you been able to do uh, under quarantine and under uh, um, you know quarantine light, as it were? Uh, very busy, actually. Uh, I'm involved in three exhibits that uh, we've been able to work remotely um, and plan and kind of work on things. 
with those. Um, I'm also working with my colleague Meredith Mann from the Manuscripts, Archives, and Rare Books Division, along with the Humanities Center at CUNY on a Earth Day open house that's coming up next week uh, on Earth Day. Um, so that's gonna feature some historic collections from the library that we've digitized, uh, along with some climate action uh, plans and programming that CUNY's been doing. Um, so we're really working on uh, ramping up our virtual presence and also creating blogs and lib guides. Uh, Nancy Kandoyan, uh, our famous cataloger that I'm sure everyone knows, uh, just produced a really great lib guide on geospatial research that can be done while the library is closed. Uh, so we're, we've all been busy trying to really um, ramp up our digital asset. The library has, I'm sure, as Harvard and Boston Public has as well, uh, cooperated with our vendors to make a lot more of our databases available from home. Uh, so we're really working around what's available and how to best help our researchers. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, and can you tell us all about the exhibitions you're working on? Uh, yes, yeah, so we have uh, coming up first is uh, our exhibit on the centenary of the 19th Amendment uh, called Her Voice, Her Vote. Um, so that is hopefully going to open August, September, October, depending on how this all plays out. Yeah. Um, and then there's a fantastic exhibit after that on Arctic photography that I'm contributing some maps to. Um, that's going to be really incredible. I got to um, go to the review of that a little while before we closed, and the images and the design and the display and everything is just really incredible. And then, uh, of course, opening late this year, early next year, New York Public Library has our treasures exhibit, um, which is uh, a first for us and will be on permanent display. Uh, so working on making the, the first iteration of that a smashing success with all of my fellow curators and our exhibitions team. Can you give us a hint of anything that's going to be in that one? I don't know, Dave. Do you, are you fond of Solarius? <laughs> or uh, mm, maybe any sort of mapping related to uh, first contact Europeans in the Americas? Sounds pretty good. Uh, for yeah, those of us, Solarius is a, uh, a um, celestial atlas. Um, it's in the purview people. of the map division, so. Yeah. Um, you can ask us questions. We'll be taking some questions now. Um, I encourage you to use the little uh, question button, but you can put it in so that everyone can see it. Um, Katie, Katie one, Parker had a question. Exactly. Um, wonderful question. Uh, we are working uh, with our friends in New York, government as well as uh, Columbia CUNY and their geospatial departments um, on seeing how we can best collect uh, the, the geospatial resources that are being created around the coronavirus. Um, luckily for us living in New York, uh, they haven't, I don't feel, I, the last time I checked, they haven't gotten around to it, but New York City uh, is very great at creating open data sets. Um, so we're very fortunate about that. And so we'll definitely be seeing how we can collect those as this goes forward. That sounds great. We've got another question, if I can bring it up. Um, uh, no, that wasn't really a question. It was a hello, but hello. Um, does anyone else <laughs> have any other questions uh, for Ian? Or Dave, they can be about anything. They don't have to be able to learn. They can be about anything. Try us. Um, the, um, do you, what kind of data do you guys collect at the map division there? Uh, currently we're working uh, on a lot of big data collections that we already have um, and working with our digital teams uh, across the library to put those uh, up and get those mined. We've had a lot of success. For example, uh, we have the Emigrant Savings Bank. Uh, we have their entire archive. And so that was a bank that was set up in New York City specifically to help uh, new immigrants to the city secure loans. And what's great about that is we have some uh, partners at Columbia, CUNY, 
uh, and other universities that are using that in combination with our available fire insurance data and the census data that's available from our local ISCU and genealogy division to really dive down to the apartment level, the building level, and then identify everyone who lived in those buildings and then map the change over time as the Immigrant Savings Bank grew and provided more loans and those people were able to move, uh, especially up from the Lower East Side uh, into Midtown of Manhattan and into Queens and Brooklyn. Yeah, uh, so that's know, a that's a great example of using that data. Yeah, both using that and making data from from the the map. Yeah, and so we've got that. Uh, we've recently, uh, thanks to our digital team, been able to digitize and working on OCRing all of our city directories, mm -hmm. uh, which I think is about 175 years of city directories. So that's providing like really pinpoint large, really granular data sets uh, that we're putting out there. Yeah. That sounds great. Uh, we have one question about how many uh, Laotians were involved in the map work. Um, it wasn't, uh, for, for what was produced, it actually wasn't a very large team. Uh, I don't, um, because the archive is physically at the library, I don't have the specific numbers in front of me, um, but it was in the 20s. Um, it wasn't like an extremely large um, project. Um, okay. So the amount of work that they were able to do, especially under the confines that they had and finding out once they got in country that um, the maps that the, the French were using, um, these set maps uh, were were not useful at all is pretty incredible. Mm -hmm. um, and just to, to refresh anyone that, that has just come in, we're talking about um, some maps made by Raymond Fink uh, and a, his team of, of Western researchers and uh, kind of Laotian um, uh, survey gatherers and map makers to um, get demographic data and, and survey data out of um, different Laotian villages um, in the late 50s. Um, another question, it has to do with how this, uh, you know, you talked about how this fits in as a kind of archival set. How does, what other kind of uh, Asian and Laotian map collections are at the NYPL map division? Kind of how does it, how do you think of that area that within the strengths of the collection? Uh, one of the reasons I was excited about getting this collection is its kind of contemporariness. Um, a lot of what we have, which is similar to the Library of Congress, is we have a lot of um, the maps that were given back to the libraries that helped with the war effort in World War II. Uh, so we have a lot of sets um, and a lot of captured maps related uh, to that era. Um, kind of the early 40s going into this period. So this really ties into that, but at a, at a much more uh, localized level. Yeah. Um, uh, we have another question too. Uh, how did you process from our co-host at the BPL? How did you process the collection when you brought it in? Uh, it was brought in in parts. Um, you know, one of the things that's, that's, that can be great about people who bring these collections is, is that, uh, uh, Raymond wasn't really certain that we would be as excited as we have been about it. So he brought in the maps first and then mentioned that he actually had uh, the original survey books, the original methodology for picking out the villages, the addresses. And so we got it in, uh, in about three shipments. Um, and I have processed the map collections. Uh, then we're working with the archives division. Uh, we just got the last bit of the kind of more traditional archival portion right before we close. So we're going to work on processing that. We do have um, the manuscripts division has their own metadata portal, uh, manuscripts.nypl.org. And that uh, works more as a typical archival layout. So kind of by box level. Um, and so this will be reflected both in the traditional catalog uh, we believe in the archives portal and then also in digital collections, which provides uh, a really good range of, of ways for researchers to find the items. Yeah, no, that sounds great. I know that we're, we're trying to figure that out ourselves as we're uh, building up, trying to build up some of our archival collections, how, how best to, to make it discoverable. Um, are there any last questions? We're coming up on the, the half hour. So this has been great. Thank you for coming in. Thank um, you. And thank you all for, for coming in. As, again, as I said before, next week we'll have Catherine Parker, who's the research officer 
at Barry Lawrence Ruderman Antique Maps and Associate Editor for the Hackwood Society. She'll be talking about George Anson and Maps and Books. Uh, and a recently featured researcher at New York Public Library. It's true. Yeah, you guys have a great interview. You can check it out on their, on their blog. And um, yeah, as always, feel free to drop us questions in, uh, in Instagram, and we'll look forward to seeing you next week. All right, good to see you, Ian. Stay safe. You too, Dave. Mercator for life. Mercator for life. <laughs> all right, thank you all for coming, and we'll see you next week.